Who can recount God's mighty acts or proclaim all his praise? Who can express or even imagine all the great wondrous and awesome things that our master, our teacher, our mentor, the light of lights, the most for the collective soul of the Jewish people and upon whom all the worlds are dependent, even more what he did and accomplished for his followers who merited to bask in his presence, his holy presence, and to hear teachings from his mouth, what the ancient of days had hidden, especially what he did and accomplished for me, especially poor and needy as I am, raising me up from the dust and the dung and sitting me next to him. He brought me specifically close to him with his compassion and authorized me to receive and transcribe all of his Torah teachings, talks and stories. He gave me the privilege to write all of it and he once explicitly said that there is no one who understands him besides me and other similar such phases. That's Rab Natan talking. The truth is that my soul knows much that it is impossible to convey, though I have already written much and told very much to my friends and followers. Thank God my words have made an impression due to his great power and the truth has entered their hearts like a burning fire. Many have become aroused to God and have many have passed from his world in holiness and purity, leaving the world with the good name of Torah, prayer and full faith. Their portion is still with life and those who are still here for long lives are strong with God's help in the truth and in faith, like a cast mirror that will never falter. Yet despite all this, I know that even they have much to learn and they still do not know the light of the truth of truths and its perfect truth as is appropriate and as it is engraved in my own soul. What can I say? All my words here touch on sweet experiences of godly revelations in the heart which can only be experienced by each individual according to the perceptions of their heart. But these are his mighty acts and those are his awesome wonders and that he toiled so much and spared no effort in the purpose of God, that he merited what he merited and rose to where he rose. And in that, he drew such deep understandings, deep waters that provide counsel in the heart of man, so deep who can grasp it, until with his exalted wisdom and awesome powers he was able to enlighten with his goodness a lonely and decrepit heart such experiences of divine revelation that are impossible to describe to anyone else. There has never been anything like this in history. This, this is alluded to in his lesson in Likutei Moharan, where he states that we need a great teacher, an awesome craftsman and a faithful healer can bring experiences of godliness into the hearts of those who are so lowly, spiritually ill and distant from God. But though the means of writing of speech are inadequate to describe even the thousands of what is in my heart. Nevertheless, I cannot absolve myself completely. Therefore, from the day I merited to become his follower, God strengthened me, as did he, to tell in the writing of the awesome revelations of this holy Torah lessons. God also strengthened me to always write down all the comments and informal talks that arose in connection with each lesson, for I knew that every single word of his was an entire lesson. However, at the beginning, I was not careful to write down all the holy talks and holy words that came out of his holy mouth, but only that which had a direct connection with the revelation of the lesson, but other informal talks I was not careful to write down. And whoever truly seeks will be able to find wondrous things in most of his talks, including much arousal to serve God, many points of advice and encouragement to never despair and other such teachings, and if any entry seems pointless, it is pointless only to the reader. For even the mundane conversations of our great and holy Rebbe open up awesome light and have great power to arouse the entire world to serve God, which was the Rebbe's sole purpose in this world throughout his holy life. It was also heard directly from him that even his mundane conversations need to be written down, for though there are very deep intentions in each and everything he says, and they are general rules for everyone to derive from them wondrous advice and upright guidance in how to serve God. The Rebbe 
delivered the Torah lesson printed in Likutei Moharan on Rosh Hashanah in Bratzlov 5563. Rosh Hashanah that year fell on Monday and Tuesday and it was his first Rosh Hashanah in Bratzlov and the first one after I became his follower. People were already talking at the time about the compulsory conscription that the government was planning to pass against the Jews, a decree that had already been passed in our times. Such degrees had already been considered even under Polish rule before the Russian Tsar conquered our regions. After the conquest, the impetus to pass the decree abated for a while, but then it was revived and people began talking about these various decrees that were called points. Around this time, the Rebbe revealed the Torah lesson that begins with, every person must say to himself, the entire world was only created for me. Seek to fill what the world is lacking and pray on others' behalf before the passing of the judgment. This alluded to those decrees. On Shabbat, Chanukah, the Rebbe gave the lesson which speaks about bringing down and humiliating the wicked. Who humiliates the wicked to the ground? At that time, he was involved in bringing down and humiliating a certain well-known wicked person in Nemirov from whom his followers suffered greatly. They had told him about this person and after Chanukah, after he had delivered that lesson on Shabbat, Chanukah, that wicked person suffered a great downfall. After that lesson, he said wittily, when you leave here and people ask you what you have accomplished, say, we have accomplished ruach, air, but indeed we have attained a living spirit from him that had filled all our shortcomings as explained in that lesson. The Rebbe danced a lot after that lesson as he did several times during the year. The Rebbe claimed that the lessons he gave on the parables of Rabbah Bar Chana were quoted from the one who originally said them, that is, Rabbah Bar Chana himself. During the year 5566, in which the Rebbe delivered the lesson on Shabbat Chanukah, many Goyim converted to Judaism, having found contradictions to their faith in their own literature, this phenomenon and its cause are mentioned in that lesson. Such things have happened in the past as heard from several converts. But during that year after the Rebbe said the lesson on Shabbat Chanukah, all of a sudden a certain priest from a neighboring village converted. The priest later visited the Rebbe and told him how he had found contradictions to his faith and their own literature and a woman who converted with her sons told of how her relatives had also converted because they had found contradictions to their faith in their own texts. This phenomenon repeated itself several times. There is also the very well-known story of the convert of recent generations who it is told converted because he found contradictions to their faith in their own books. I personally spoke with one who told me a similar story about finding contradictions to their faith in their own books. The mystery of this phenomenon is explained clearly in this Torah lesson. Understand it well. Many Goyim converted to Judaism during that period after the Rebbe gave that lesson. Regarding what was said just before about not priding oneself before one has reached the land of Israel, for one must endure many troubles and obstacles before reaching there. He once spoke about the great obstacles and dangers he faced in Istanbul on his way there. He then added that he would not have to endure such obstacles and dangers as he did and would be able to reach there more easily, though we certainly must be ready to endure suffering and overcome obstacles before reaching there, for the land of Israel is one of the three things that can be acquired only with hardship. When the Rebbe concluded this lesson, he quipped, I have given a lesson today through fire and water, for the lesson speaks about words that are like cool and about the drawing of a water from a rock. Regarding the transcendent intelligences that each person will see receive in the future, according to their efforts in this world, the Rebbe said that there are things a person can do in this world in order to be able to continue rising from level to level in the world,
of the future as well and they continuously be able to attain new transcendent intelligence. There is a wondrous allusion to this in the lesson which speaks about Miriam's disrespect to Moses and Aaron's prayer on her behalf, which is connected with the suffering caused by a Leverite marriage to the deceased soul. It seems to allude to the Rebbe's own daughter Miriam, who went through a Leverite marriage in Israel several years after the Rebbe's passing, after having moved there with Reb Lebush of Valashak, who had taken all of his children with him, including his daughter-in-law, the Rebbe's daughter Miriam. When the Rebbe delivered the lesson, those who fulfill his word to hear the voice of his word. Rabbi Natan had been already practicing the teaching of this lesson of nighttime solitary meditation on his own initiative. But on this day, when he came before the Rebbe, he saw with his very awesome and amazing spiritual vision that Rabbi Natan was doing, the Rebbe revealed to him this teaching. And Rabbi Natan heard the Rebbe revealing what one can achieve with this awesome practice which Rabbi Natan had been following on his own, as well as an account of his deep sense of the pleasantness of the Rebbe's holy words. He lost all sense of his physical existence and began screaming, Kaval! Let me go out and scream in the streets. What are these people thinking to themselves? He was so impassioned that he lost all human sensibilities and indeed wanted to run out screaming. But the Rebbe grabbed hold of him by his garment and said to him, Stay here. You won't accomplish anything anyway. My friend Rab Nafti and I once went to the Rebbe. And shortly before Shavuot, 55, 65, he told us that now he knows nothing at all. All I know now, he said, is that due to gossip that Sadiqim cannot be humble. And that beyond that, he knew nothing. He explicitly said, just as you don't know, in the same way, I now know nothing at all. He continued by saying that now... He is conducting himself like a simple person who arises in the morning to pray, then learns a bit, then recites psalms, then eats, takes a nap, and then arises to speak to God with his own words, seeking compassion and mercy. And indeed, he said, I have compassion on myself. He said these last words with such sincerity and brokenheartedness that anyone who heard them could actually sense the great compassion he had on himself, as if he were utterly distant from God. He also told us at this time that he had dreamed that it was Shavuot and we were all gathered there with him for the festival as was our custom but he was completely unable to deliver a lesson in the dream he severely berated and chastised us saying that it was all our own fault that he wasn't able to deliver a lesson because of our grossness the lessons of the tzaddik are made from the people who come and gather with him after delivering this teaching, which then goes on to speak about how this dominion is sometimes visible and sometimes hidden, and that someone may process no visible dominion at all, yet possess great hidden dominion. The Rebbe explicitly commented about himself, it may seem to you that I will influence only over you, but the truth is that I rule over all the tzaddikim of the generation but it is hidden. The lesson concludes by speaking about the impossibility of understanding God's contradicting ways since these and those are both the words of the living God and that through the halakhic opinion of one sadiq is accepted over that of another, yet regarding both we say these and these are both the words of the living God, which is beyond our comprehension. Later that evening, the Rebbe spoke more about this point when talking with his followers. He said that though there is an answer to this question in Kabbalistic literature, that the reason why one opinion is lenient while the other is stringent is because the formula is related to the Sefira of Chesed, whereas the latter to the Sefira of Vura. And thus indeed they are both the words of the living God. Nevertheless, anyone with a bit of understanding can see that these answers are not real answers at all. I challenge anyone to come here and answer this question the Rebbe proclaimed. If one says that this food is kosher and may be eaten while the others say just the opposite and they that it may not be eaten, how can we possibly understand that they are both correct since each one is saying the antithesis of the other? The Remy meant to say that the answers given such questions are of no value and certainly not the answers 
given in the philosophy books, which are absolutely of no value. For this reason, the Rebbe forbade us from even looking into the philosophical works written by religious Jews, since they raise very strong questions on God's ways, go into length with these questions, but the answers they provide for their questions are very weak and easily refuted. Thus, those who study these books in the hope of answering these questions rationally may end up falling into hearsay, for they will realize that the answers are worthless and the questions remain. Therefore, it is completely forbidden to look into these works, but one must rather rely solely on faith. If a question of this sort arises in one mind, one must realize that there is no rational answer, for it is impossible for our human minds to grasp God's ways. We must have faith that surely everything is correct and true, only that we are unable to understand God's ways with our human intellects, as the Rebbe has said many times. Everything that happened to his offspring has very far-reaching meaning. Whatever happens to every single human being has much hidden meaning. For there is nothing meaningless in this world, but the greater the person, the more meaningful is whatever happens to them. The Rebbe's holy offspring, though, are so extremely exalted that whatever they had to go on through was connected with great spiritual battles because of the far-reaching meaning. This is what happened after the crowd had left We remained standing before him. The Rebbe then noticed that my shoe was very warped, such that the front of the sole faced the top of the shoe. The Rebbe quipped, your shoe looks like a slap in the face. Then he was silent for a while. We certainly believe that nothing the Rebbe said can be taken at face value. There are great secrets in whatever he said. And then the Rebbe indeed said, our light conversation, stressing the word our. Let some Kabbalist explain to me how all the Kabbalistic intentions of circumcision and even what is beyond them are alluded to in this comment. The Rebbe then began speaking with holy and awesome grace. Sometimes a person is slapped in the faith and sometimes is slapped by a shoe. He cited the words of the sages regarding the prohibition of marrying a pregnant widow or divorcee, lest the embryo develop formlessly like the sole of a shoe as if it had been slapped by a shoe. He also cited other words of the sages, where a shoe is used as a metaphor. All these cases allude that there are hidden secrets in the shoe and the sole of a shoe and regarding being slapped in the face with the shoe. All this is connected with the blemish of the covenant and its rectification, which is the rectification of circumcision. He then delivered to us this entire lesson. Though none of us understood it at the time, he did not connect the ideas in the lesson, but everything was in illusions and insights. Throughout, we saw with our own eyes the greatness of God, how in the casual talk of the righteous are contained such great secrets of Torah, may God show us wonders and that we're worthy of understanding all of this completely. After that, the Rebbe said, how can we allow God to think and make decrees? He added, wittingly, O oh God, don't make Dumi remain silent. We must not allow God to Dumen, which means think in Ukrainian. We must not allow God to think. Regarding the Rebbe's statement that one should work oneself into a frenzy during prayers, he said that this is the same concept as the sage's statement, one should always rouse one's good inclination into a frenzy against the evil inclination, for one must be able to rouse the energy for holy purposes, such as prayer. The Rebbe said one must bang one's head on the wall, that is, bang one's intellectual understanding onto the walls of one's heart. I heard in his name that he said that this corresponds to Chizkiyahu turning his face to the wall, meaning that he turned his faith, 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 his mind and intelligence to the walls of his heart for the essence of the face is wisdom and intelligence, which is the light of the face. The Rebbe said that the section in his Sefer Hamidot on medicine and healing originally contained remedies for every single illness in the world, but he did not want to have it publicized, so he burnt it. During the month of Elul, the Rebbe told that he had dreamed about 
wanting to enter a house to hear the shofar, passing a certain house and hearing how they were singing, clapping their hands and dancing intensely, rejoicing, jumping and frolicking as do people when they are extremely happy. I said to myself, this is certainly a good place to go and hear the shofar. I do not recall the rest of the story. Someone was present commented that this story is alluded to in the Kutay Muharan where the Rebbe quotes the Zohar that says that the breath that creates the truth, the trua, the sounds of the shofar causes idolatry to disappear to which one benefits and becomes able to clap the hands and dance as in the spirit wind that blows through the six joints of the arm and the six joints of the leg from which we see that the sound of the shofar corresponds to clapping the hands and dancing he used to talk a lot about the thoughts he had while busy with his devotions during his youth he envisioned that he wanted to remain completely unknown and did not want to live off of others' financial support. He had many different plans how he would remain unknown and how he would support himself. Sometimes he considered making the rounds, begging in a way that he could remain unknown. Shortly after leaving his home on his trip to Israel, the Rebbe spent a Shabbat in the village of Shkola, there he had a vision of the renowned Sadiq of Menachem Mendel of Itebsk who revealed to him that the divine name of Atta is protective on high seas, as is mentioned in the Kutay Muran, quoting the verse, when the seas waves surge, Atta calm them. There is more to tell you about this form when I heard the same, when I heard his name, but I can't remember now and I would have to inquire of those who heard it from Rabshim. When I traveled with him to Uman at the end of his life, he consoled me in the carriage with several beautiful and holy words of encouragement. I understood from his holy words the greatness of God's compassion and that God will and that God will ultimately reveal the truth and make things good for us. And I shared my heartfelt feelings with him. Indeed, God will ultimately actualize his will. The Rebbe responded in surprise. What do you mean that God will actualize his will? God is always actualizing. God is always helping the Jewish people. There is never an often generation as when one of the Tanaim said the Torah will never be forgotten from Israel. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said, no, this Zohar will take them out of the exile. For the verse says that it will not be forgotten from their offspring. The Rebbe then went down into the reason why Rabbi Shimon based his words on this verse and revealed the secret teaching printed in the beginning of Likutei Moran about the greatness of Rabbi Shimon, I then commented, Rabbi Shimon must certainly have pleasure now from this very novel idea. Definitely so, answered the Rabbi. Lady added, but Rabbi Shimon himself is something quite different. Rabbi Shimon is a holy one who has come down from heaven. The acronym words in Daniel speak out Rabbi Shimon's name. Now though there is a flowing stream, a fountain of wisdom, an acronym of these words in Proverbs which spells out the Rebbe's name. The Rebbe had already spoken before about himself as being a river that purifies all sins. On the journey right outside Uman before he entered, the Rebbe told the story about how the Baal Shem Tov once came to some place and was extremely depressed and sad there. The people there realized that he was depressed, but who would have dared to ask him about this? This went on for about a day and a half. Then on Friday afternoon, the Baal Shem Tov instructed to bring all visitors in town to eat with them on the Shabbos. There were not many visitors in town, but they managed to find two foot travelers whom they brought to him. Afterwards, the Baal Shem was heard, the Baal Shem Tov was heard arguing with them. The Rebbe said that he did not recall well the details of the story, but the gist was that in all this town there were souls from the three centuries earlier who had not ascended. So when the Baal Shem Tov arrived there, all these souls gathered around him. For such souls are always yearning for such a person who will be able to rectify them. This was why the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh was depressed, for this matter weighed very heavily upon him. The point was that he realized that he could not rectify them unless he himself died. This created a difficult dilemma for the Baal Shem Tov, which was why he was depressed, but God arranged for these two people to be there, through which the Baal Shem Tov was spared and apparently some harm befell those two as a result. Furthermore, the main purpose of the Rebbe's death, therefore, was in order to elevate those martyred souls as we understood 
from what he once said that there are tens of thousands of souls there that need elevation. In fact, on Tuesday, the first day of Cholam Sukkah, the very, very day before his death, he asked me, do you remember the story I told you? Which story I asked him? The story of the Baal Shem Tov that I told you as we entered Uman. Yes, I replied, it is a long time now that these souls have been looking to trap me here. He continued, there are not only thousands of souls here, but many tens of thousands. That night he continued speaking along these lines, saying that many judgments and much martyrdom had taken place here, but you have nothing to worry about, he said, since I am going before you and ahead of you. Those of my followers have already died, may have something to worry about, but you have nothing to worry about since I am going on ahead of you. If the souls who never knew me anticipate my rectifications, you can surely rely on me. After settling in Uman, the Rebbe once asked us in the middle of a conversation, do you remember when I began speaking about Uman? I remember, I said, it was when you called for Rabbi Yudl to ask him about the Sophia Park, but the Rebbe said, you also don't know or remember. I definitely spoke about it even before that. By the time I spoke to the Yudl, I was already well into that matter and already delved into it very deeply. By that time, I was already able to bring it up in conversation that had some practical relevance. Then he added, Neither are the rest of you wise. You think that it has to do with Nachman Natan, but the truth is that it is not even a thousandth of a thousandth of a percent of why I came. I also heard that he once told someone, you don't realize that when one of them comes and humbles himself, that is he enters before the Rebbe and humbles himself before holiness, all the heavens humble themselves. The Rebbe said that regarding fulfilling God's explicit will, he has absolutely no difficulty or need to exert any effort. Even all the suffering in the world, and the Rebbe certainly knew suffering that he could not even express verbally. He would gladly accept it if he was sure that something was God's will. If it is God's will, he would be willing to endure anything. And nothing and no suffering would be too much for him to bear. However, the greatest, his greatest effort in suffering is when things are left to his own understanding. To choose according to his own will as Moses added a day according to his own understanding. This is the hardest thing. Once and one is never sure how to act and one may sometimes suffer and still not be sure if it was God's will. Moses Smashing the table, the tablets was also done on his own understanding among other, th other things. The Rebbe spoke about at this at length. Then he began speaking with me about his moving to Uman, for he was very happy to be in Uman, he said. And even if he has to live somewhere, he prefers that it be in Uman. And regarding his eventual death, he also said that he would like to be in Uman because a great martyrdom once took place there where thousands and tens of thousands were slaughtered. The Goyim wanted the Jews to convert, but they decided to die martyr's death rather than convert. And even Jews who were killed for no reason are also considered martyrs. Tens of thousands, including babies and children, were put to death in gruesome ways, all of which was a sanctification of God's name. And regarding the heretics living in Uman, they are from the spiritual dregs, the Rebbe said, which is why they are heretics. But even they possess sparks of holiness that needed refinement. Then he revealed to me a dream about a wedding. What a bridegroom this is, what a young man this is. Then I said to the Rebbe, but isn't it a great accomplishment to influence a free will being? Definitely, the Rebbe answered. That goes without saying, gesturing with the movement of his holy hands that such an accomplishment of eliciting change in a free will being is immeasurable. But we added, but you have forgotten how much time it takes. His holy intention was to say that though certainly this accomplishment of influ influencing a free will being is immeasurable. The enormous time it takes is to do so. The outcome of the efforts of which is itself very doubtful because a free will being is so difficult to help could be better to put to use by elevating the souls of thousands and tens of thousands of souls that have departed who are so much easier to influence. This was the cause of his great doubt and this was the essential point of his free choice since he received no guidance on this issue, which is the concept of Moses adding a day in his own initiative.